when I when I know that the enemy is upset and there's all kinds of things going on, I know that I'm heading in the right direction and I'm doing the right things. And uh, you know what? When you think about it, the enemy, uh, hey, uh, for the person that is that he's got or are, are doing nothing, uh, he says, oh, don't have to worry about them. Sometimes life, life will be, uh, it might be easy if you would, but if you're doing the right thing and you are being used by the Lord, um, the enemy will will come against you. And so we're going to talk. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But uh, today, if I could put a title on on uh, this study, uh, would be it's happening. It's happening. It's happening right now. Three things. One, uh, we're going to be talking about an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I truly believe that that we have seen in the last 120 years, we've seen the Spirit of God being poured out at different points at different times. And uh, I know that the Holy Spirit is, is being poured out on different individuals as they are open to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. And I see what's being done through them. Uh, so that's happening. We're going to be talking about also uh, a falling away. The fact, three signs, three things before the Lord returns. And one of them will be, is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, there is, there is and it's happening now, a great falling away. And I'll, I'll explain that. And thirdly, uh, just to take a quick look at Israel. Uh, that Israel is God's prophetic time piece. And uh, uh, so I just want to, I want to touch on, on the, the second and third thing, this great falling away. You might say, what, what are you talking about there, Pastor? Uh, I want to talk about the second and third thing first and go back to and finish off with the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy 4. Verse 1, and uh, uh, there are many passages, many scriptures that we could get into, and I don't want to, uh, it would take hours and hours. We could spend weeks on studying uh, different uh, things of prof uh, prophecy in these last times. I just want to touch briefly on, on a few things here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It says, now the Spirit expressly says, that's the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So they will depart from the faith. You might say, what faith? Faith that saves. Faith that and that faith is in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. That's the faith we're talking about. We're not talking about faith in yourself. We're not talking about faith in the government. We're not talking about faith in the church. Uh, not talking about faith in my good works. I'm talking about faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And there's going to be a departing from the faith, that faith. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So uh, in these last days, and I'm seeing this at this time, that there's at different points, I was just talking to, to Greg earlier, he says, you know, pastors, they don't talk about hell. They don't talk about sin. If you don't talk about sin, you don't, the consequence, the wages of sin is death. And, and eternity apart from God. Well, pastors oftentimes say, I don't want to say that in church because I may offend somebody or, or maybe they, they, they don't, they want to, they don't want to hear those kinds of things. I'll tell you right now, uh, I would hate to, to beat around the bush when it comes to the thing of an eternity with God or apart from God. I wouldn't want to beat around the bush with that. And it says here that there will be some that will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And some of this, these uh, uh, is not just individuals, but sometimes they're led astray by those that are in leadership. 
And so we've talked about this in the past, that there's what there is is a moving away from the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's a, which is the gospel. It is the gospel. And so there's other messages, there's other things that, w- that are there to tickle ears, even uh, to allow deceiving spirits. We're talking demonic things and doctrines of demons to creep into the church. And so as a pastor, I, I want to say this. You have opportunity with with our uh, in our day and age that you can uh, hey you can listen to a lot of different people online. We have the capability. It wasn't there forty or fifty years ago. If you wanted to hear somebody else, uh, or you know, you'd go and go to uh, this church or that church or whatever, and and you could do that. You'd have to physically drive. Now, hey, listen, if I wanted to, I could just pull up my phone, and I could just tap in anybody that I wanted to listen to, and I could listen to them right now. And it just come up. I could go back in the last year and listen, listen. And one of the things that I've come to do, um, oh, somebody called me. One of the things that, that uh uh, I've come to do w- when it comes to listening uh, to different podcasts or whatever. I, I don't just listen at them at normal speed. I'm listening to them at like 1.5 speed or 1.75 speed or even two times speed very quickly. So, you know, an hour can condense to a half an hour. But you know what? As believers, who are we listening to? And who, what, what are we, what are we taking in? Is it, is it? And there, are, there are messages out there that that are are not the gospel of Jesus. They're another gospel. And so there's a falling away from what saves us, Jesus, to the church of Ephesus, even to a church that was doing a lot of good work. They were doing a lot of social things. And to each of the churches, he says, the Lord says, I've seen your works. And especially the church of Ephesus, the very first one mentioned in Revelations chapter 2. He says, I've seen your works. And unless you repent and return to your first love, I'm going to remove the candlestick from you. And I say, what's the candlestick? The thing is, your witness, the, the opportunity for you to bring others to the Lord. Because you're not taking, or you're, the gospel isn't being presented anymore. There's no witness. There's no declaring of the gospel. And the Lord's saying, I need for you to get back to your first love. And really, when you think about it, when you first loved the Lord, when you first came to the Lord, you came You confessed your sin as you responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died for you. He took all your sins upon himself. And he died for you. He loved you so much. And and as you said, Lord, yes, I'm a sinner. I confess I'm a sinner. But you died for me. I believe that. And, And I'm asking you to come into my life. I'm submitting to you. And... This past Sunday, there was a a lady here that gave her life to the Lord. And after the, the, uh, as as we were saying the sinner's prayer, the tears just started to flow. And about, it was about 20 minutes, almost half an hour later, the tears were still flowing. Is this normal behavior? Is this normal that I'm crying? And it wasn't tears of, 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 regret or or sadness it was tears of of joy and appreciation and just recognizing there's a what i'm right with god so there's this this thing of 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 returning to her first love because there are other another gospel is being presented a, a different jesus is being hey jesus is like I don't know, a slot machine or whatever you put in so much. Hey, I want this, or I, I pull the, the handle, and, and hopefully something comes to me, Jesus. Because it's all about what you can do for me, Jesus. And if you're not producing, you're not uh, whatever, I'm not prospering, 
you know, I, I, well, hey, Jesus, I, I, I don't know if I can serve you. Some of the stuff that's creeping into the church at this time we're talking is insidious and blatantly open where you have things that are blatantly new age is coming into the church and there's a, a, a little, just a change of, of the name of what it is to, to make it more Christian, but it's taken right from pagan uh, uh, religions and new age beliefs and, and practices in the church. Doctrines of demons, they're departing from, from the faith. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, from verse 1, it says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Basically, Paul's saying, hey, Jesus hasn't come back yet. So if anybody said that Jesus came back and you didn't make it, he hasn't come back yet. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. I believe there can be a falling away even by a person that comes to church because their, uh, their faith is in, in their, the, the tradition, the ritual, the practice of coming to church. If I come to church, I, I'm going to make it. Now, I'm not saying, hey, I'm not saying don't come to church. Absolutely. In fact, as we see the day of the Lord approaching, we should especially be assembling together. We need to be in the house of the Lord. But if we place our faith in something other than Jesus Christ, there is a falling away that can take place because our faith is no longer in Jesus for salvation, but it's in our, myself or my religious activities or my spiritual uh, disciplines, whatever it may be. That our faith would be in one thing and one thing alone, Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. So here in Second Thessalonians, it talks about the fact that there will be a falling away. And I see at times where, where the things of the Lord become secondary. It's almost to the point where I'm going to start my own church, like the church of Laodicea. It wasn't the church, or it's not the church of Laodicea, the city. It was the church of the Laodiceans, as in they had started their own church. Their own, or they're doing their own thing. And they, it says, Jesus says about them, you think that you're rich. And you're, you're clothed and you're covered and you've got it all together. He says, but you are poor, you're wretched, you're naked. And that's where the verse comes in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man would hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will dine with him. Jesus was on the outside knocking to try to get in to the church or into these people's lives because they're already at a place. He says, you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I believe that's taking place right now. There's a spewing out of the Lord's mouth because people are at a place where they're, they're casual about their salvation and what they believe. Ah, you know what? It's not a big deal. The things of the Lord, it's not a big deal. There's a falling away that would come first. So this is, this is happening. It's happening as we speak. And the Lord says, this is a sign of my my near return. Second thing I want to I want to uh, talk about just quickly. And I mentioned this, uh, and I've been sort of giving you heads ups on this just as it's happening. Uh, if you could turn to Daniel chapter nine verse twenty seven, Daniel chapter nine twenty seven, and this this passage is we're, we're talking roughly Daniel at that point it's like five fifty B C ish. Okay, around 550 B.C., Daniel probably has been incarcerated or has been taken away into captivity by the Babylonians 
uh, he was taken into captivity at 605 B.C. So at least 50 years before he was already taken into captivity as the, the Babylonian king uh, Nebuchadnezzar came against uh, Jerusalem and took all the, the noble, uh, nobility, all the wise, wise men and all those that were uh, these young. Daniel was just a young, probably a he was a teenager most likely. But it was like the, these are the, the future leaders that will make change. He took 10,000 of them from Jerusalem in 605. And uh, then there was, in uh, 586 B.C., uh, just uh, 15 or 20 years later, where the, the, this, the entire walls were, were broken down. And uh, uh, as the Babylonians said, hey, we don't want to have nothing standing there. Uh, but this is what Daniel, in captivity, the Lord gave to him regarding the last days. Amazing that it's coming to pass right now. It says in this verse, then he, and that is the Antichrist, this, this one that will arise that Daniel was so wanting to know about. He's saying this last beast that came up or this, I want to know. What, what about this one? This one is concerning me. And it talks about uh, in the previous, uh, in chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, right through to 12, it highlights different things about the Antichrist that is coming that will be in the last days. Truly, I believe that he is here already. In fact, I, he is here already. He has not been revealed. And three times I wanted to say, well, this is who I think it is. And three times I was checked. Three times I was checked, do not reveal this person. You may know who it is, but don't reveal it. Don't reveal them. So the last time, the third time, the first time it's like, ah, Lord, I was lined up to next week. I was going to be talking about it. A year or two later, it was like same thing. I was talking around this thing, and it's like, okay. And then the third time was earlier in, the, in this year where I was talking about this passage and, and, and Second Thessalonians, and it's like, I'm coming and, uh, again, saying, hey, these are characteristics of the Antichrist and whatever. And let me just say who I think it may be. Could possibly be. And, again, there's a check. Do not reveal them. Don't reveal them. It's like it says, it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says he won't be revealed until that which is is restraining, is taking away. The thing that restrains the Antichrist from coming to the forefront is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is restraining the Antichrist from coming forward. But it says in this verse, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, some of these words did not jump out at me four years ago. I did a whole study through Daniel four or five years ago. Did another one like two or three years ago, touched on it this year. But now this, it's, it's amazing prophecies taking place. And so there's been a covenant with many. And who's he talking about? The covenant is talking about, in chapter 9, it talks about Israel, about Jerusalem, the people of, of, of the Lord, not the believers. The church was not in place yet. Jesus had not come yet, but and Daniel didn't even know the extent of the church, as in those that are Gentiles. He just knew that, hey, the Jews are the people, the chosen of God. And so it was concerning the Jews about J uh, Jerusalem, the holy city, and, and God's children or people, the Jews. And here it is. The Antichrist will confirm or strengthen, that word confirm, is strengthen a covenant or a treaty with many for one week. And that week being a, a, a week of years. So that word week in the Hebrew can also mean not just days, a week of days, 
but a week of years. And in this case, it means a week of years, as in seven years. The treaties, the treaties are right now being passed. In fact, this year alone, there is one that began in January with the Palestinians. They rejected it. And for the first time in 70 years, Israel has favor from many Arab nations. They were always against Israel. Well, just in the last month and a half, United Arab Emirates has signed a, a covenant with Israel. They're already flying back and forth between, they, that has not happened. They're landing in the UAE, is landing in Israel. Israel is landing with planes going to the UAE. This is, that passage is the foundation of a covenant that the Antichrist will strengthen is now being put into place. The covenant is being put into place with many. I didn't get it until even this year, this this covenant with many. It's actually not many, just many people. We're talking nations. So then right after, with the UAE was Bahrain, which are a group of islands right off of Saudi Arabia and the, uh, the Gulf. And then just in the last week, this past week, I heard Sudan, the Sudan now, is wanting, to, is, is, there's talks with, with uh, uh, Israel and, and the United States is brokering this, these, these talks. And so the Sudan is also most likely going to sign a tr this treaty, a treaty with Israel. And there are, are others as well now that are talking. They're even thinking like Saudi Arabia. And, and so different countries are, are, this is coming to pass. Listen, this is, this week doesn't begin until the church is caught up. The foundation for the covenant or the treaty that is going to be strengthened with many is the foundation is being laid already, is there right now. It's happening right now. We know that the Lord is coming soon. It's happening. Praise God. It's amazing. Now, the last thing, and this is what I really want to focus in on tonight. The Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. The church needs the Holy Spirit. We can go through the motions of church without the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, we are dead. The Holy Spirit breathes life within us. Without the, the allowing, listen, we can, we can grieve the Holy Spirit by not allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our, in our church, in our service, or even in our lives. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. And this is something we should not do. Now, you might just say, why should I have the Holy Spirit? One of the things is power. Well, we need the power of the Holy Spirit like never before. And mainly for the sake of the lost, the wayward, and the backslidden. But we need the Holy Spirit to begin with, even just for ourselves. We need the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about a portion of the Spirit. Where I'm talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit that was on Jesus Christ. We need that same fullness. So I want to read a few scriptures. Because it allows us, when we have the Holy Spirit, it allows us to overcome and for things to happen that would not normally happen. It would not normally happen because there's not the fullness of the Spirit. You say, well, a lot of times you might say, well, you know, even a portion of the Spirit, wouldn't that be enough to do great works? Yes, but the hindrance is not so much the Holy Spirit, but it is us. We hinder the Holy Spirit. We have doubts. We have uh, 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 questions or we, we have fears. We are intimidated or whatever. But look what it says here in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. 
Zechariah 4, verse 6. And Zechariah was, was prophesying and, and encouraging that the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 was totally the temple, Solomon's temple, we're talking beautiful, was totally raised. It was totally taken down, right down to the foundation. It was beautiful. Beautiful. And here now, they're rebuilding a temple. And, and so there's encouragement to continue to, to finish off building the temple. And so in Zechariah 4, verse 6, it says, And so he answered and said to me, This is a word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, a mountain. We're talking about obstacles, the obstacles that may be in your life. And the Lord is saying here, not by human might, not nor by human power or effort, but by my spirit, the spirit of God, the mountains can be removed. The things that are obstacles in our life are removed and made. It's not even that we go over or go around. It says here, the mountain is made. You shall become a plain, flat, by the Spirit of God. God desires for us to have the Holy Spirit so that we can overcome the obstacles, the mountains, the difficulties, struggles you have in your life, Lord, that I would operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to, to do, a, a, do the things the Lord would have me do, but also just to live my life before the Lord in a, in a, a way that is pleasing to Him. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 6, you say, well, that's Old Testament. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The power of his might, the power of his spirit in our lives. Be strong in the Lord. Now, this passage in Ephesians 6 is talking about the fact that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but we are wrestling against the enemy. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes, the lies, the deceptions of the enemy, of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, uh, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in, in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The whole armor. He's saying, listen, you will be in battles. If you're facing battles, and right now I know the enemy is attacking because I'm dealing with things as a pastor. I'm dealing with things now. It's like, and it, there's, it's not like there's ever a let up. There's always things that I'm dealing with. I'm, when I say dealing with, I'm talking about people and what, what they're going through. And the struggles that they're facing and, and, and whatever, the attacks of the enemy on them. But in the last little while, we're talking, there have been numerous people, none of them related, none of them knowing any, anything, uh, what, what the other might be going through. And they're, I'm, I'm being made aware of these things and having to, to, to deal with these things. There's attack of the enemy because we, we will have battles. We put on the whole armor and after the battle, do we have to be afraid? Absolutely not. In fact, that we would move forward powerfully, not in our own strength, not our own might, because we can't take on the enemy in our own strength and might, but we can take him on easily in the power of the Lord, in the power of his might, as we take on the whole armor. When you look at this armor, that is, is everything is talking about who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross, whether it's salvation, whether it's the breastplate of righteousness, whether it's the the shield of faith, faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Whether it's the belt of truth, Jesus is the truth. He is our peace, having our feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The, the, he is the, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, having the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus is the word. He is our armor. As we put on Jesus in, his, in the fullness by faith in him, 
we are able to overcome as we go into the battle, that we will be able to overcome. Let me just say this. This is very interesting. In the, this past year, last half year, I've had numerous people come to me that have known the Lord for years, and there's a question. I spent an hour, not, I was talking to somebody, uh, not from this church here. I've never met this person. They had served the Lord and loved the Lord uh, for a good chunk of their life and well on in years and was talking to this, this lady And she was saying, I don't know if I can trust the word of God. I don't know if I, am I even saved? I, the way I'm feeling. And there's a questioning because of how I'm feeling and the, the, the different things that I'm going through. Am I even saved? And I came to recognize, and some of it was very close to home, the importance of the belt of truth that the Lord would have around us that we need to put on. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. He is the truth. And the truth of who Jesus is, what he's done for us, the truth of his word, he is the word, and the truth that, is, that we should have wrapped around us, and it's almost like the enemy is saying, hey, I want you to take off that belt of truth, and he's questioning, is it even necessary? In fact, this, this is the, f the first year, and I've, hey, I've done studies, I've done uh, whatever on, on Ephesians chapter 6 and the armor of God over the years, and this is the first time that I recognize the importance of the belt of truth to the extent that it is. Because if we start questioning the word of God, we start questioning Jesus, we start questioning what he's done for us on the cross, we take off that belt. You say, well, what does the belt do in battle? Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever watched bodybuild or not bodybuilding, but weightlifting, power lifters, what they do is they have this uh, a thicker belt around them. You might say, well, what does that, what's that for for the, for the soldier? I'll tell you right now, when you have that belt around your, your loins, there is, there is an opportunity, there is this thing of strength. A lot of the battle that was being done with the shield or whatever, like we are talking about pushing or close combat, there is, is you are pushing. You are, there is a physical coming against something that is in your way. Sometimes the, the enemy is like it's right there. And there's this fighting and the, this pushing against, and th this belt holds everything or gives you that extra strength. Hey, take off the belt, and now suddenly like you have weakness. Your, your back can go. Tearing this and that. That's why when you're lifting heavy weights, especially the, the squatters, they're squatting, they're lifting up. I, I, I heard one of the, this one guy can lift over a thousand pounds. Well, I'll tell you right now, if he didn't have a belt on, he'd be ripping stuff all over the place. And the belt helps to strengthen. And same with us. So when there's a questioning of truth, I'll tell you, you fall apart when you start to, I, I can't, I don't know if I can handle the fact that, well, did Jesus really save me? Am I really saved? And now it's like, I can't, I, I don't even want to do anything because I'm even questioning. I, I, I'm, I'm stuck in this thing of, of depression and of anxiety and fear, and I just can't do anything. I don't even know if I'm going to make it. The truth shall set you free. The truth of who Jesus Christ is will set us free. And so this thing of, of, of the armor of God, is, and I love this. Yeah, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. So there, as evil comes against you, that you're able to stand. 
And when it's all said and done, that you're standing. That statement is a statement of when the battle is over, when the battle is over and you're down, the reason you're down is either you're dead or you're extremely wounded. You go down. But it says here to stand in the evil day, and when it's done, to stand. Where am I here? Here I am. And having done all, to stand. This is Ephesians 6, verse 13. The Holy Spirit is there to help us to, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And in the time of battle, the Lord gives us, with the Holy Spirit, the power to overcome, to have victory in the battle. Now, one of the things we say, Pastor, all these different attacks coming on different people, one of the things, we need to pray for each other. We need to be there to encourage. When you see somebody down, you don't say, hey, you know, hey, you know what so-and-so did? Love covers a multitude of sins. If somebody slips and falls or whatever, hey, here, let me just, listen, I am here to, to, to encourage you. I'm here. Yeah, the Lord is able to forgive. The Lord is able to, to, to wash away the things of sin. I'm there. You, or even when there's a questioning and, and, and the enemy's coming against whatever area of, of, of the armor, Lord, we're there to stand alongside our brother and sister in the Lord that's going through the battle. We find out, you know, in the Old Testament, when they were building, rebuilding the wall, because they were so spread out and they were building up different sections, some of the wall around Jerusalem had, had, uh, was still standing, but there were numerous sections along the way that, that were broken down and they were rebuilding. So they had a trowel in one hand and they had a spear in another and they had a horn with them as well. So the, the, the trowel was to continue to work on the wall. The, the um, spear was, hey, we're going to defend as the enemy may come and go through the wall. It's not completed. But the horn was as the enemy was coming, there would be a blowing of the horn to say, hey, we're under attack. This section of the wall is under attack. For goodness sake, you need to come and help. This is why it is important. Oftentimes, when we are struggling or we're in, in difficulty and we're, we're going through battle, the worst thing you can do is not tell somebody. The worst thing you can do is just say, well, I, I've hear, heard this. I hear this on a regular, oh, I don't want to bother Pastor Dave because he's really busy. Are you kidding me? I, yeah, sure, I'm busy. I, I, there's a lot of different things that I do. But when there is... When I get a call and, or somebody texts me and I, I find out that somebody's going through a hard time, there is an immediate, the next, I make, I make two calls right after somebody calls me. I'll pray with them. The second call I'll make or, or t uh, I will immediately call Nancy. You say, hey, why Nancy? Because Nancy is in charge of starting a team of prayer warriors to pray for that need. So that I make one call to Nancy, I tell her what the need is, and I pray with her regarding the need, and the next thing is she's calling the next uh, two or three people, and it goes down the line, lines of, of people that, that are mobilized to begin to pray. It's, it's a blowing of the horn because you're in battle. The other text that will go out is to, to the, the elders of the church. The, the pastors, I'm so, it's so, so exciting that my, when I text the group text, I've got two pastors, one in, one in, in, in training, if you would, other one is here at this time, just able to, to send that text out, and immediately there's prayer that goes up for this situation. To be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, his spirit. Secondly, about the Holy Spirit, the, the power of the Holy Spirit brings life. And let me, let me just actually, let me just give one more verse before I get to the second point about bringing life. Acts chapter 10, verse uh, uh, 38. Jesus, 
to accomplish what he accomplished, to do what he did in ministry, it was in the power of the Holy Spirit. It says in Acts 10, 38, it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So the Lord is saying, listen, I want you to have that same power that was on me. Jesus is saying, I want, the same, I want you to have the same power. And, and Peter here is saying, hey, the Holy Spirit was on Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit too, the fullness. As a believer, we need the fullness of the Holy Spirit upon us. Because the fullness of the Holy Spirit upon us helps us to do good, to bring about healing, and to deal with those who are oppressed by the devil, for God is with us by his spirit. The Holy Spirit allows us to bring life to others. In Joel chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So the former rain was in, would have been around October. You say, well, that's kind of weird. And then it says the latter rain in the first month. The first month of the Jewish calendar would be around in our springtime, April, around April. So there would be this rain that comes. You say, well, what, what does this have to do with the Spirit of God? I just want to read a passage. It says, and it shall come to pass. This is Joel 2. This is a few verses later. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. I want to pour my Spirit out so that there can be life that, that comes. Jesus said in John 7, verse 37, he says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, really wants the things of the Lord, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he, he expands and he, he on this to give some some clarity he says but this he spoke concerning the spirit <coughs> the holy spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the holy spirit was not yet given because jesus was not yet glorified there was that outpouring of the holy spirit on the day of pentecost this was after jesus was raised from this after he was raised to life after the, being crucified and buried he was raised to life, and after 40 days of being on the planet, after being raised from the dead, he says again and again in different Gospels, he's saying, hey, listen, I want you to have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I want you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, because with it comes rivers of living water will begin to flow from us. You know what? I got saved when I was seven, but I got filled and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 14. And I'll tell you, things began to take off when it came to the Lord working through me to minister to others. I don't say that, just say, hey, look at how great I am. What I'm saying, I'm talking about reality. The reality of it is the moment that I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, as I was, and I was still flawed. You might say, Pastor, did you stop sinning after you got baptized in the Holy Spirit? No. There were times where I still sinned and uh, slipped and fell. There's times where I might still slip and fall at this point. But I'll tell you, the work that was able to be done through a flawed individual that was yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit was amazing, even as a 15-year-old a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 21-year-old, a 30-year-old, and right to, the, to this ripe old age that I am now, the Lord is still continuing to do a work through me by his spirit. We need the spirit of God. Lord, give us the spirit upon us. Let it flow through us. 
that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the power of the Holy Spirit always is through and would be tied in with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the message of, of who Jesus is and what he did for us. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, the message of the cross. The power of the Holy Spirit comes through our faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul is writing about the Galatians. He says, who? Who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? Who has lied to you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Was he not portray to you? Did I not portray to you when I came here that Jesus Christ was crucified? This only I want to learn from you. I want to know from you, did you receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, by the works of the law, by keeping the law, or by the hearing of faith? That faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Now, verse 5, and it's a question here, and it's a rhetorical question. It says, therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Your faith in Jesus Christ portrayed as crucified. That's where my faith is at, and the Holy Spirit is supplied to us. But the fullness of the Holy Spirit without measure Lord, fill me with your spirit that I can be a witness for the sake of the lost. In Joel 2, verse 28, this was 800 years, 800 B.C. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my maid ser men servants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and, and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. But it says here, it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is there to help us to proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. As people here, they would call on the name of the Lord so that they can be saved. Can we stand together? We've got about we got 10 minutes or so. I want to make a quick invitation for those. If there's anybody here, you're not in the right place. Can I just say this? The Holy Spirit, you cannot have the Holy Spirit without faith in Jesus Christ, without giving your life to Jesus. You cannot have the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you right now, if you think you have the Holy Spirit without being saved, you don't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit only comes, as Paul says, was not Jesus Christ portrayed to you as crucified? Did, didn't I share the gospel with you? And the Holy Spirit came as you received and believed in Jesus Christ. So I want to give an opportunity. If there's anybody here that you're maybe not in the place that you should be, that you would get your, your life right with the Lord. And uh, you would just confess, Lord, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I need you. I, I believe in who you are and what you did, did for me on the cross. You died for me. I believe that. And you took all my sins upon yourself. I believe that. And I invite you into my life. Be not just my Savior, but my Lord. And tonight, if that's your prayer, make that your prayer. Confess your sin. Confess Jesus Christ and him crucified for you and allow him to be a part of your life because as you do, now the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit is available to you. Praise God. Praise God. So what I here's what I want to do for the last number of, of minutes that we have together. Where you are, I want you to begin to pray. And whether you pray out loud or whether you pray quietly 
I'll leave that to you. Whether you want to stand where you are, you want to sit where you are, you want to walk, you want to pace, I don't, it doesn't matter, but that you would begin to cry out, Lord, we need your spirit. My, my spouse needs your spirit. I need your spirit. My spouse needs your spirit. My children need your spirit. If they're, if they're believers, if they're believers, Lord, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, the church, let the power of the Holy Spirit begin to fall. That we begin to cry out to the Lord for the sake of the lost, for the sake of those that, that need him. For our sake, as we fight against the enemy, we be strong in the Lord and the power of his might that many would come, that we would overcome, and that there would be many also that would come to know Jesus. So I want you to begin to pray out all across this sanctuary. I want you to begin to pray out, hallelujah, hallelujah, up on top in the balcony as well. You begin to, let's cry out to the Lord. I'll tell you, uh, our, our young people, they need the, ba the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Our young adults, our adults, we need, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, we need the Holy Spirit, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Lord Jesus.